Hello, you argumentative souls. Bo So is a two-time world champion debater, the former coach of the Australian National Debating Team and the Harvard College Debating Union. He's also a widely published journalist and the author of the new book, Good Arguments, How Debate Teaches Us to Listen and Be Heard. Bo, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? Oh, g'day, Trey. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, Bo. So what was your goal with Good Arguments? You know, I think we're living at a time when it's not only that we disagree poorly, right? I, I mean, even among friends, you can see so many families and workplaces and communities driven apart by disagreement. It's not only that we're disagreeing badly, but the thing that really worries me is that we're losing confidence in what disagreement can do for us. I think the prevailing ethic of our time is to find like for like and to find our people. We say that in dating, you know, um, to turn out the base, sort of the prevailing logic of our politics. And I sort of understand that, you know, and I think the impulse to run away from disagreement is not only a political position, but I sort of feel it in my personal life too. But my aim in writing this book was to restore people's confidence and faith in what disagreement can do, and hopefully to provide some uh, practical tools um, that can help people get started um, and to come at things with a, a different set of skills and a, and a richer set of tools than what they started with. I'm in complete agreement with you on that, Bo, and my audience is probably getting me a little bit tired of me talking about this, but speaking with somebody that you don't agree with is so important and has been throughout human history, not necessarily because you are going to end up agreeing with that person at the end of the dialogue, at the end of the debate, but maybe you have a better understanding and a little bit more respect of where that person is coming from. So for you, keeping that in mind, what else is it about disagreement that is healthy for us humans to engage in? I liked what you said a lot. Um, and for me, disagreement is just a, and a belief in the importance of disagreement is an acknowledgement on one level um, that we are not self-sufficient. Right? We don't have all the answers. We can't see everything. And in that way, you know, debate and disagreement sort of starts with the self and what you have to say and the arguments that you have to put forward. But the real magic of it comes in the encounter. Right? And when you jump into a disagreement, it's not only a vote of confidence in your ability to articulate yourself, but it's also a kind of a, a leap that the other person is going to receive you in good faith. And that put together, the two of you can do something more than what you might have been able to do on your own. And, you know, so the, the, the bottom level, most literal reading of this book is how do we debate in the way that how do we negotiate better? How do we mediate conflicts better? But the higher level question is, how do we disagree better, right? And the level above that is, what do we do about the fact that we're really different? Um, and it's not just racial differences or sexual differences or something like that. It's just that each person in their fullness is just different from all the other people. And, um, and the fact that, you know, we have to live together in spite of, not only in spite of those differences, I want to say, but in a way that respects and harnesses those differences um, to help us lead more rich and, and, uh, and, and better lives. And so, um, yeah, you see, I, I, I put a lot in disagreement. <laughs> um, I put a lot of weight on it. Clearly. And even though you have established yourself out throughout your young life as a world-class debater, uh, winning a couple of different international championships in the process, 
you haven't always uh, been somebody who is all about the debate. As a matter of fact, as you talk about and good arguments early in your life, you avoided conflict at all costs. How did that change on a spring afternoon in May of 2005? <laughs> um, thanks for um, thanks for shouting out. That's like the film trailer. Uh, <laughs> intro to that. Um, it changed because I joined the debate team, right? And um, you know, it seems like a really bad idea actually to join the debate team if you're a shy kid. But for me, especially, I had just moved. I was born in South Korea, and I moved to Australia when I was eight. And uh, and I didn't have the language, right? And you know one of the only um, non-white kids in the year, like my, my difference was very visible in, in, in a lot of ways. And, and the hardest part of that transition for me was adjusting to what we're doing now, which is real life conversation, uh, which actually gets harder when people are disagreeing because the pace tends to pick up and you know, sometimes when people are disagreeing, the words don't match what their face is doing. <laughs> and, and, and people are more likely to interrupt and those kinds of things. And, and so I had a real hard go of it. And I basically, you know, I was probably, a, a, I was a pretty shy and conflict averse kid to start with. But that experience of just being spun out in conversation so much on the playground and in the classroom, um, made me make conflict aversion like a way of life. It was a decision for me. This is the kind of person I was gonna be. I was gonna be agreeable. The thing that you know sort of shook me out of that was on the debate team, the first rule is when someone's speaking, no one else talks. And when I heard that, like, it was like some kind of a siren call, right? Like, I mean, my ship didn't wreck itself, but you know, it, it was just irresistible. It was, you know, it was exactly what I wanted, what I needed. And I didn't even know I needed it. And so the idea that people would listen to you and no one would interrupt and, and you get to jot a few thoughts down so you're not completely lost, that was an amazing thing. And, and that, so that began the transition for me. But, you know, it is a, it is a story of transformation and change, but I have to say like the impulse to, run away from disagreement or um, just to say, you know, I'm too tired for this. I don't have the energy for this, or I don't think it's gonna get anywhere or kind of a hopelessness and despair. Um, that's still with me, you know? So I wouldn't say it's a kind of a, he was like this and now he's like this. It's a, those impulses are, I think, always in the background. Um, for the individual, it's there in our culture, it's there in our politics. Um, and I don't think my book is gonna change that, but my, I'm hoping it'll nudge us, right? Towards being able to see the positive elements of debate um, and disagreement, things that have to be managed, um, but to, to recognize that potential again, because it's not a new idea, it's been with us. Um, and, and, and that process of rediscovery, I think, uh, is really needed at this time. Speaking for you personally, you even admit in this book, after you had become a good debater, I think in your late teenage years, you were somebody who was still very conflict adverse in your day to day life. And that did eventually change in some way, shape or form. But just walking around this planet right now, you're not necessarily looking to get into arguments. That, that's very interesting. I mean, I'm certainly um, looking to get into some arguments rather than others, right? Okay. And, 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 and in this world where the will to disagree, right, is kind of ascendant in some quarters and, and, the, and the channels by which we can do that are now like infinite, right? You can, like we can just stop now and go on Twitter and just fight someone. Um, actually the tools of understanding how disagreements work, but also being judicious about the kinds of disagreements we engage in are really important. So um, one of the chapters in the book actually are, is devoted to 
thinking about when we should disagree and when we shouldn't. Um, and um, I can talk a little bit more about that, but, um, but the message of the book is in part that having the skill set in place, right, um, and understanding disagreements better um, allows us to pick and choose in a more judicious way the kinds of disagreements that are likely to be worthy of our time. And once we have made that choice to make the most of it. Yeah, we will definitely talk about that RISA or RISA acronym yeah. here shortly. First, though, this book was broken down into nine different components. That would be the uh, important elements for a uh, good debate. And then also some situations that you can counter in life and the unique challenges that they may pose. So chapter one is topic or how to find the debate. What is topic analysis, Bo, and why is it so important for being good at debating with others? So you're right. The, the basic structure of the book is to analyze the different elements. And I was a, you know, a debate coach um, uh, in addition to being a competitor. So I did that at the highest level. And in the way that I would teach my students, I wanted to teach the reader right from the beginning, the basic elements of debate. Um, and then in the second half to put it to life um, in different areas of the world, whether that be technology or personal relationships um, or education. The topic analysis um, was for me the right place to start the book because it's the, it's the place where a debate round starts, right? So the amount of time that you have in a debate to prepare varies. Um, and it can, but it can be as short as 15 minutes. Um, and that sounds kind of daunting because you have to speak for seven minutes after 15 minutes of preparation. Um, but in real life, you have like zero minutes, right? Like you, you, someone springs a disagreement on you and you have to kind of react, right? And, and in that moment, it's very easy to just react off of gut, right? Or to, or to jump into a disagreement without really thinking about it. And, you know, you, I often have the experience at least of kind of getting into a disagreement and thinking, what's this disagreement about again? <laughs> you know, or like, what are, we, what are we shouting about again? And, and that, that's probably true in real time, but it's especially true in retrospect where like, you think about a falling out you had with a friend um, and you're like, what? You, you can remember the ill feeling, right? You can often remember how you felt, how, how confusing it was, how hurtful it was, but sometimes hard to think about what it actually, what it was about, right? And I think one reason for that is because in any disagreement, there are lots of disagreements, right? So at a most basic level, it could be, we're having a debate about a COVID or something, but I actually didn't really like the tone that you used. And that's really the subtext of the whole thing, you know, and those are two different disagreements living in ostensibly one conversation. So topic analysis begins by unpacking where the real heart of a disagreement is. So the example that I give in the book is consider, you know, two parents who are having a disagreement about whether to send their kids to the local public school. It seems like just a straightforward disagreement about whether you should do this thing or not, right? Whether you send the kids or not. But embedded in that are all these other disagreements. Like they might disagree about what their kids are like, right? And, and how they're likely to react in a certain situation. They might disagree about what the schools are like, right? They might just have different facts available to them about what the conditions are like, what activities they have. Then they might have more philosophical disagreements about what's our obligation as citizens to the local public school system um, and so on. So within that one topic or that one sort of subject of disagreement about whether we send the kids or not, 
the actual sending of the kids is like maybe the least important thing if you think about the underlying disagreements that you have to resolve and once you resolve those the action kind of follows so um i give a, a bunch of different tools for analyzing in the book um how to do that work um but in broad brush strokes um that's the idea that a disagreement contains multitudes in some ways we need a way of very quickly deciphering and actually um in some ways coming to an agreement right so a really good argument can often come can often begin with agreement about what the debate is actually about and what the disagreement is about and topic analysis is a kind of a tool um, to help with that chapter two is argument or how to make a point there are two burdens of proof that an argument needs to show before it can convince the listener truth and importance why these two that's exactly right um so think about an argument right so let's say um the argument is um we should not eat meat um because it is uh environmentally damaging the the production of the meat is environmentally damaging you have to do two things there you have to show that actually meat is bad for the environment the eating of meat is bad for the environment and the other one is and this is the importance prong you have to show that the fact that it is bad for the environment is enough of a reason for us to stop eating meat right and those are the two prongs truth and importance because if the argument is untrue it really doesn't go anywhere right it's just like that's that's not true and the importance prong which is the one that i think people forget more about um is the thing that actually connects the truth of a claim to an action right why is it that this thing being true means that i have to like change the way in which i live and what i buy at the store so um i think the those two things speak to expectations that people have of of what we expect another person to do in order to change our minds and i'm sure there are you know it makes sense to me logically i'm sure there are you know other kind of underlying reasons why these these are the minimum of what we want people to do for us when when they try to persuade us but i think there is a kind of a truth to how it is that people change their mind and and what it is that actually gets them to you know get off the couch and do something and um at a minimum for me it has to do with proving these um basic burdens and um the argument is obviously the basic building block of a debate right so i offer an argument you critique it you give arguments back and um this kind of way of analyzing it you know i, I can see people thinking you're overthinking this it's it's a kind of you know it's too formulaic but returning the kind of the craft and returning the skill set to argument as not just like an earnest confession of my feelings but as a way of thinking about well what do i actually have to do here and how am i going to do that um i think it's something that's missing at the moment and 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 in starting quite early in the book by establishing that groundwork um i hope that readers are able to see how that um brings a bit more substance and structure to our conversations you just mentioned your own feelings how important is it to establish some sort of emotional connection with the audience when you're debating so important so important um and you know this is actually something probably that um that debaters sometimes lose sight of 
right? And 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 you know, in the in the book, I tell the story about you know my my college roommate was um, like a kind of a political activist, and and he gave speeches too. Um, but while I was kind of traveling around the US doing nine to 12 debate rounds in a weekend, he would be kind of speaking at rallies, you know? And, um, and I think it was really him who told me that, you know, it's not only a, kind of a, in order, in order to have that kind of an emotional connection, you have to show yourself and how you got to the place where you are and, and how it is that those ideas came to be lodged in your head. Because, you know, people aren't, we don't know anything about most, <laughs> just talk to myself, talk about myself. I don't know most things about most things, about most things but, um, but you know, people are pretty good at judging other people um, because we've just been doing it all our lives. And, and, and so it, it does make sense to me that, you know, that showing yourself is a big part of persuading people. And that, and that this kind of like, I don't think you can, um, th there aren't easy hacks here. You know, there isn't like some magic combination of words is going to, stir people's hearts and so on. I do think it is some kind of real careful attention to what you're doing, but also a, an element of self-disclosure and a willingness to be in a, a relationship with the other person for no matter how brief a period, right? And um, that was a lesson I learned writing this book as well, because you know, um, in a debate speech, it's often kind of voice of God sort of thing. It's like someone just kind of, um, hailing down these declarations about the economy or about international relations and so on. And, and in an early draft of this book, I also was kind of like, this is what debate is. I've worked it out or, or the community has worked it out. Here's the truth. And, and it sort of became that in order for me to bring readers along, um, but in order for them to also know what I'm saying is kind of right. <laughs> Um, they're going to have to hear from where, where, where I am coming from and the limits of that in a lot of ways, right? Um, and, and, and the very narrow experience I've had as just one person. But equally, um, to see that, you know, even one person's education kind of fully told um, can contain lessons that, that might be useful. So the, um, the emotions point is really key. And um, the connection I would make is um, those, that kind of emotional connection arises from the encounter and the relationship um, between people. And, um, and, and yeah, I think it's a wonderful, you know, idea of persuasion that it's not just like you're some wizard behind the veil um, acting on the world, but you're kind of out there, you know, and you're trying to connect and, and you're trying to, um, to bring people along. It's kind of messier, I think, you know, and, and in that way, debate um, and my view of persuasion is not just if only we could be more clinical and organized and rational and logical and so on. Um, I think that would take all the fun out of it, really. Um, so we want to keep room for emotion and personality and connection. And I think that's a really important part of the work that persuasion does. Yeah, not to spoil the end, but that's one of the advantages that we still maintain over technology right now, because technology is now in the game of debating humans, at least for right now, humans still seem to have that emotional connection over our uh, machinery with which we are becoming uh, more enslaved to on a daily basis. Yeah, I like that a lot, Trey. Like, 
But, you know, hearing you say that makes me think there are ways in which our arguments are becoming more mechanical these days, hmm. um, you know, and um, like meme, right? I think that like memes, not the, not the Sp Spider-Man pointing at each other, but the, um, <laughs> <laughs> like there are political memes, right? And like taglines and catchphrases and, um, and we do the algorithms work for them by like, hashtagging our thoughts you know and um and so this kind of i guess because it's easy maybe and it's easily organized for sure it's definitely rewarded on a lot of these platforms but man like the the urge to turn ourselves into machines is a very scary thing and um and i and we see it in arguments too and in the in what you mentioned um, I write a little bit in the book about um, the debate between, uh, so IBM who did um, Deep Blue, that chess playing machine that, that competed against Kasparov and, um, and the one that played Jeopardy. They also built a, a, a debating machine. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's pretty good. Like it, 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 it makes sense, you know? And these are real arguments and in some, narrow aspects of debate like the ability to generate an extraordinary amount of facts um, and to search them up um, I think it, it can best us in a lot of ways um, but what I'm arguing for here is a really human tradition right and it and it stretches back all the way to antiquity where um, the roots of debate are in kind of uh, ancient Greek rhetorical tradition, where the ability to speak before a crowd and to communicate and to persuade was seen as the duty of every citizen, right? And um, I don't know what technology they had back then, but it wasn't Twitter, right? So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that kind of going into a forum or a room unmediated in that way kind of naked like I think those guys were sort of naked right with the togas but like hmm. but just sort of exposed and to be able to um to do something really elemental which is to to share what you feel and what you think they should do or think um that's a really primitive kind of a thing actually and um and I want to say like our best hope lies in that rather than um, allowing ourselves or forcing ourselves to fit around an algorithm um, and, and, and to become more machine-like because you know, as we were saying before, it's a way to remove a lot of what the messiness that makes us special. Um, a lot of the messiness that makes us special. I'm glad you mentioned some of those ancient philosophers who were also debaters to a T because debate used to happen in public forum. I'm sure there were uh, certain rules to warfare, but uh, for uh, all the uh, things that didn't exist back then, that seems like one of those things that I would have really enjoyed taking part in. Chapter three is rebuttal or how to push back. What is a counterclaim and why is it the embodiment of justifiable hope, according to Aristotle? So a counterclaim, I will just stuck on the justifiable whole thing, but um, a counterclaim is, so you, I say something, I say an argument. Um, you, you criticize the argument, right? You probably leave a big dent in it, um, or you, you, or, or you make a chip or, or you might even break it, right? And so now I have to say something else. Um, and and I have to say something that's better than what I said before, right? And then you're going to, that's gonna force you to evolve your rebuttal to my argument too, because your criticism I've just fixed it, right? So there's this kind of process of evolution that happens, and these are really, really incremental. Um, you know, you're not gonna 
constantly be having breakthroughs, but even a kind of a slight adjustment in stance um, means that we're not stuck in just yelling our kind of slogans at each other from a distance. Um, we're moving a little bit. And so, um, you know, I, I really don't, um, I don't believe that we can't change other people's minds. And one of the reasons why I think that is even if you, if there's no like road to Damascus moment or a 180 degree turn, um, people shift and, 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 and nuance their beliefs and, and readjust their beliefs um, in lots of little ways. Um, and, that, and that happens through a conversation, I think you know, and it matters in debate that there's turns. So I talk and then you talk and I know I get to talk again. And then you know you get to talk again. So it's not an instance of just publication, like you're just publishing your views or, um, you know, with, we were talking before about social media where the structure of it is like, sometimes the reply like uh, what's it called um subtweet <laughs> you know what it's got, where you don't where you don't even know the other person's talking about you or they're criticizing you or something like that that's not an encounter it's not a, like there's not really a lot of room for evolution there um because there isn't this turn taking um and uh uh so the counterclaim, um, and, the, and, there are, and there are different ways to do it, and, and, and I talk about it kind of more tactically in the book, but, but the gist of the idea is that process of critique and response is how ideas develop and how we um, move forward and change our, our, our minds in lots of small um, but important ways. Chapter four, Bo, is rhetoric or how to move people. Now, when I encountered this chapter, I couldn't help but to think, well, rhetoric has such a negative connotation in society nowadays. Why is this? And what does good rhetoric look like? I, I sort of agree with that diagnosis, right? And, and the, the critiques of rhetoric um, are many and overlapping, right? There's an idea that you're sort of insincere, um, that you're glib, um, you're kind of, um, yeah, varnishing or, or just kind of distorting, you know, the truth um, through the manipulation of language. I think um, it gets back to the point that you were making a couple of answers ago where you have marketing departments now who are coming up with these three word slogans to try and sway the masses when you really think about those three words, there's nothing behind them other than a catchphrase. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. And I want to say two things about that. I think one is um, kind of like disagreement itself. Um, rhetoric causes all kinds of problems, right? And, and it can be a vehicle for insincerity for, um, kind of emptiness, which I think is what you're saying with the, with the three slogans, uh, with the three word slogans, but kind of like disagreements themselves, you wouldn't really want life without it, right? And the reason is um, rhetoric in that, in that kind of alchemical, slightly magical way, like actually gets us to move, you know? And it makes us, see things more clearly, more fully, um, and to feel things. Um, and so I, I sort of break down what I, think, what I think some of the keys to that magic are and some of the practical things that we might be able to do, but I don't pretend I, I've, I've got it because it is like kind of a little bit outside our grasp how this thing works, how words affect us and, and how it changes us. Do you want to say something? Uh, well, I just, I think the 10 rules that you laid out are phenomenal. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to start applying that more yeah. in my life because I think that we're all guilty of these things. And if you can have enough awareness in the moment to understand where you're maybe being a little bit 
passive or you're doing a little bit too much labeling versus making a larger point on top of some of the things at the end, like naming the stakeholder, uh, maybe for that emotional effect and then finding the applause line. Those are things that made so much sense as I read them, but I had never thought about it like that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And, 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 and a lot of it was me trying to distill, um, uh, the lessons that I had learned that I had taught in as kind of clear a way as possible, but they are, um, you know, credit where credit is due. They are like the collective wisdom of what this community of debaters um, has kind of forged over generations. And so I think I did some polishing and distilling and, and sharpening as with all the other lessons in the book, but they are, um, in some ways, kind of wisdom and practices that have been passed down through generations. Um, and, and the final point that I'll just make is, those kinds of abuses that we talked about that have turned us off rhetoric in lots of ways, right? Um, and, and, and we know that rhetoric is a feature of, um, demagoguery, right, of, of authoritarian leadership too. Um, I wanna sort of say that our immunity to that uh, comes from a clearer understanding of how it actually works. Um, and our immunity to the abuses of argument more generally um, and of speech more generally comes from um, a kind of a regaining of this skill set that I think we've allowed to atrophy, um, that we've lost. And, and, and so the disillusionment with rhetoric is in some ways a reason to re-engage with it um, rather than to, um, to give up on it altogether. Chapter five is quiet or how to know when to disagree. You stepped away from debating in January of 2015 after a decade of, how you put it, obsessive commitments. During this time off, you came up with a list of four conditions that made an argument worth pursuing. What were those four conditions? Four conditions are, and these are, you know, it's like a checklist, right? It's a kind of a mental checklist to think, is this particular argument worthwhile or not? Is to ask whether the argument is in fact real, right? Or, and, and we have the experience of having kind of perceived slights, for example, when like that's not what the other person said <laughs> or it's not what they meant. Um, so you want it to be real. You want it to be important enough to you to justify the disagreement. Um, and, and things can be important to people for different reasons. But I think some of the ugliest disagreements that we have come about in part because you, expect, you expected this kind of trivial thing to resolve very quickly, but it didn't. And it sort of snowballed, right? Um, or you sort of picked a disagreement because it was there and, and you could say something about it. And so you did. So the second part is just to pause and ask, is this important enough? The next is to ask whether it's specific enough, right? And so debating the, like the, the merits of libertarianism is probably not a, a, a I mean, it's something you can certainly talk about, converse about, but it's not the best thing to frame a disagreement or a debate around because it's not, it's not specific enough, right? It's not the kind of thing, it, it can allow both sides to just get everywhere and, and talk past one another and, and pick and choose different elements. Whereas a debate in sharpening that encounter between people says, is this something you can either resolve or make meaningful progress on, right? So there's a kind of a, 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 a third condition about scope and specificity. And then the last um, uh, prong is, a, is, this is the A, is whether the two sides are aligned um, in their reasons for wanting to engage in the disagreement. And 
the people go into disagreements for lots of different reasons and they don't have to be exactly the same in my view but you kind of have to be okay with why the other person is going in so mm -hmm. if you're going in really wanting to persuade the other person but their interest in com in the conversation is just to have a good conversation or to like learn something that seems okay right that that seems like you're roughly aligned but if you're going in with the genuine desire to persuade someone but the other side just wants to hurt your feelings, basically, um, or to put you down, um, that's probably not a disagreement worth um, engaging in. So the research checklist um, is just a tool to, before engaging in a kind of a, a, a form of conflict, really, right? A kind of a, um, a, an adversarial thing, to pause and to think whether this is worthwhile. It was in chapter six, self-defense or how to defeat a bully that I encountered a term that I had not heard before. So I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this, but what are heuristics? Yeah, so um, it's a, uh, I'm not sure I had known of the term before I started researching um, the book, but, uh, it's a term for bad disagreements, right? Um, bad, painful, um, pointless, circular kinds of disagreements. And um, it's kind of what we have now, right? So I think it's a kind of a term of the moment. And it comes from, um, you know, that story of um, how the Trojan War started because, um, so it's obviously um, Paris and, and, and Helen, right? But how did they get together? At, there's a kind of a wedding between some godlike entities and um, they forgot to invite someone or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the person who was not invited, I think is actually probably just unpleasant company. So she's Eris, she's a goddess of, of disputes and disagreement. And uh, because she's a bit, pissed off she comes to the wedding just crashes it throws a golden apple that says to the most beautiful and um Hera Aphrodite um Athena kind of quarrel over it and 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 this is how the um the great war begins right and so it's named after this goddess who is really a troublemaker um and, you know, in the chapter, I, I talk a lot about um, the, the contemporary practitioners of, um, of heuristics and people who can turn a, a good conversation into an heuristic. And, and they're, you know, people who lie, they're people who wrangle, people who twist words. And I, I offer some thoughts because you see them in debating as well, offer some thoughts on how to counter that. But then the, the real kicker um, and, and the bit that I wanted to get across is even in the Greek myths where there's this figure of this like, you know, of a, of a disputer, of a goddess of disputes that, that can produce a war, like the greatest war in, 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 in that history. There are in some versions of the Greek myths two, two heiresses right? One is the kind of the troublemaker, but the other one is there's a good, a goddess of kind of good disagreement that challenges us, that spurs us on, that spurs creativity, that forces us to learn from one another, to reconcile our differences. And so that kind of ambivalence is always there between disagreement being a force for good and a force for bad. Um, and the point I wanted to make with that is we're sort of surrounded by bad disagreements, bullying disagreements, pointless disagreements, but the opposite of bad disagreement is not agreement, but good disagreement. And, 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 um, that's the title. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, it is. And uh, those five forms of bullies that you lay out are the Dodger, the Wrangler, the Twister, the Liar, and then the Brawler. Uh, a persona that Donald Trump, as you point out in this book, has played well for a long time. Now, I despise a something that the brawler does in debates, and that is name calling. If somebody does it to me and I'm in the middle of a conversation or a, a debate, then I, I will usually give them one chance before shutting it down altogether. Because when it devolves to name calling, you clearly have nothing else to add to the conversation. But it's not just as easy as shutting something down if you're talking about a presidential debate or competition debate. So what's the best way to handle a brawler like this in an official setting? It's a very difficult question. Um, it's a very difficult question. And what I try to do in the book is to try and analyze um, as forensically as I can how those moves work, right? How, how, how a brawler works, how he or she behaves, because it does in fact work in a lot of settings. And the way in which it does that is I think exactly as you said, Trey, um, they pull you into a brawl so that their rules dominate rather than your rules or the rules of you know, what society views as civil conversation or disagreement. And so it actually, in some of those presidential debates you see, um, uh, it's actually not one side doing the name calling. Do you know what I mean? And the reason is um, because the impulse to treat like for like um, and, and not to seem like you're losing or you seem like you, you know, you're not tough <laughs> or something like that um, is, is, is really powerful and difficult to resist. And so uh, my instinct is very similar to yours, which is to pause, to name exactly what it is that the other side is doing and to insist that the conversation that is being had here is a debate and not a playground brawl or a shouting match or a name calling match. And so all these conversations, these different kinds of conversations that we have, have different rules, don't they? And they have different kind of logic, right? In the way that just like um, shooting the breeze with a friend has different rules than arguing with them has different rules than if you're negotiating with them. And one thing you want to be really careful of is um, allowing the brawler to change what it started as a debate into a brawl, because then different rules apply. So some, so, so, um, and there are there are lots of different tactics I discuss in the book. But one starting place is to stop to identify the behavior um, and to insist on the kinds of conversations that we're having and the kind of conversation that we're not having. Chapter seven is education or how to raise citizens. After you retired as a debate competitor, uh, you did teach at a high level for a while and you actually were able to discover some really valuable lessons in the process. One of those lessons is maybe my favorite passage in the book, Bo. Through coaching, you came to learn that it's better to think of debate, quote, not as war, but as a recurring contest or game in which losing is inevitable, winning is impermanent, and wisdom lies in responding to both with a measure of grace. What led you to this conclusion? I appreciate that. that, that that's very kind of you. I, um, so I was the coach of the Australian national debate team and of, of the Harvard um, uh, debate union, the university union. And The first of those actually was probably more affecting for me because they, they're young, they're 16 to 18 years old um, and, and completely you know, off the charts, brilliant and, and warm and mature, but still kind of kids, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, uh, and yeah, like you have to make sure they're like eating lemons so they don't get scurvy because they're kind of in your care and have to make sure they have their bag and so it's a kind of a parental thing you feel very responsible for them in, in a lot of ways and um and you know i've kind of always known that 
the best debaters, even the best debaters lose more competitions than they win. And in fact, you lose pretty much all of them because the world championships has like 500 teams and, uh, and it becomes knockout at some point. Right. So um, it's very easy to slip. And I'd kind of understood that and, and the personal disappointments um, I had experienced, but I think they were sort of subsumed um, in like my, my personal um, desire to do well. And, and, and I felt like even the losing was kind of steps along a path towards getting better. But it was really different when I was coaching because in some ways it's like out of your control, right? It's just like your heart is just in the hands of these 16 to 18 year olds who might misread the topic or might get nervous or might trip up in other ways. And, um, and anyway, so when they lost, um, this was my first year of coaching. Um, I was just immobilized. <laughs> you know, and, um, and they lost to a, a really good team from South Africa. And I was really immobile in bed. And then I, you know, woke up like two hours later and, and I just saw that they were hanging out with the, with the kids who had beaten them at the, at the swimming pool of this resort in Bali. Um, uh, and I kind of couldn't believe that, you know, and I thought, you know, really, like, there's no hard feelings here, you're, you're back to back to normal. Um, and they, they had earlier in the competition come across the South Africans and had beaten them. It was just in these final knockout rounds that they had lost. And one of the kids said, you know, the scoreboard is live, it's 1-1, one, one, right? Um, and so there was this, they had kind of understood that, yeah, there had been winners and losers in the round, in that room, but just because you beat someone, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> and just because you lose to them, they're not going anywhere. They're at the swimming pool. You're probably going to debate against them again at some point. And so even though in the round you're wanting to do everything you can to beat the other side, um, you know there are some lines that you don't cross because they're going to be there and you're going to have to talk to them again. And when you do that, you're also going to want the protection of rules and, 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 um, and, cultural values that make the conversation not terrible and arbitrary and painful. Um, and, you know, like if there is some hope that um, there's a lot of reasons to despair for our politics, but, but the point of a democracy is that it is a kind of a recurring game, right? That, that the party that loses doesn't go away. It forms the opposition. And um, in the Commonwealth tradition, where I come from, it's, um, it's Her Majesty's loyal opposition. And the way in which their loyalty manifests is not just like nodding along and clapping, um, but, but disagreeing, knowing that an organized program of opposition can be really good for a country, um, can hold the government to account and all these other things. And so um, if there's some hope, um, it's that I think so many people feel that the, the adversarial warlike approach that we have to our politics at the moment is not really working. You know, it's not serving anyone. And, and this desire to kind of bury the other side or to prune the other side or something like that, it just doesn't work because they're around, you know, um, they're still around. And, um, and, Part of what I'm hoping to do with the book is to say, well, if that's true, and we are going to have to keep talking to one another, what kind of conversation do we want to have about our differences? Um, and I think debate provides not a complete answer to that, but it, 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 it offers some insights that I think are useful um, in, in the way in which we have that conversation.
I think that dovetails nicely into my final question based on chapter eight relationships, how to fight to stay together. What is side switching as another tool to improve one's argument and how does it separate itself from other debate preparation tactics? Yeah. Um, so, so much of debate is obviously doing the best for your side, right? And, and coming up with the best arguments for what you believe and, and, the, and the side that you've been assigned. Side switch is this unusual thing where usually in the five minutes before you go into the actual round, you almost literally take out a new sheet of paper and you, uh, and there's it's different exercises that I go through in the book, but you might brainstorm what are the best arguments for their side? Or you might comb through your speech and look at it as if I was criticizing this, how would I bring this down, right? And that experience of seeing the debate through the other person's lens, not just some random person, but the person who is opposing you, whose beliefs are diametrically opposed to your own, I don't think gives you perfect insight into the other side. I'm not saying anything like that, but it unsettles things a little bit. Mm. It puts you in the position of thinking, I might not have thought this through, you know, or I might have missed something here, or a reasonable person could come to the opposite conclusion because that reasonable person is you, right? And, um, and yeah, I, I kind of raised this idea in the book is maybe we're thinking about empathy the wrong way where we think about it as like a kind of a psychic magic that happens or we think about it as a virtue that people possess as opposed to what debaters know, which is it's a series of steps. Um, but I also think, you know, it's, it's very easy to do, but I think it's also the kind of thing that might help us with how at least I feel about a lot of the, the disagreements that we have, um, in our, in our personal and political lives, which is that it's kind of stuck, you know, like you, you think this, I think something else and you know, we're kind of going around in circles a bit. And so just wanting to unstick it and to um, and to give us just little gaps for movement and persuasion um, is what I think the value of the side switch exercises are. Very well put there. He is Bo So. The new book is Good Arguments, How Debate Teaches Us to Listen and Be Heard. You get it now wherever books are sold. Bo, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this wonderfully important book. Love the conversation. Thanks so much, Trey. Thank you to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thank you to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs, hit him up on Instagram at Forger Digital. And thank you as always to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at booksonpod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.